started out as in one of those you start as one of those annoying vegans who was trying to convince other people to actually, you know, become vegans and it didn't succeed very much. How much was that part of your process of kind of coming out with Fable was kind of that you, you realized you had to have the good products there to actually convince people to change their behaviors? Yeah, um, thanks, Craig. Yeah, so, so yeah, I was super passionate about the idea of wanting to help end industrial animal agriculture. Um, and, and yeah, get, help people to transition away from eating meat. And yeah, tried to convince everyone around me to turn vegan. That, that that's a that's a tall order and hard to do. But in having all those conversations, realised people kind of get the reasons why they should reduce their meat consumption. You know, sustainability being being a big one, but also health and ethical reasons. Um, but people love the taste and texture of meat, so you know it's difficult to. Um, difficult to get people to give that up. I found it difficult to, to give that up because uh, being having grown up in Queensland, eating a lot of meat. Um, and so, yeah, if could see, I'd, I'd been living in LA doing Shoes of Prey, eating all the Beyond and Impossible burgers um, and could see that yeah, if you could give people a food that has the taste and texture of meat, but make it out of something other than animals, that's the easiest way to help people move away. We heard, heard from Vow taking a cell-based approach to that. Um, yeah, lots of companies taking different approaches to the problem, which is great. We 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 do it by making delicious meaty food from mushrooms. And and is it true, the mushroom? The part of the mushroom you use is actually a kind of a waste product, isn't it? In, in general, so you're kind of solving a couple of problems at once there. Yeah, yeah. So we use the um, stem of the shiitake mushroom, um, and and for our first product, we shred the stem so we get a slow cooked uh, meat type like texture, kind of like a brisket um, or a slow cooked beef pulled pork. Uh, and yeah, yeah, exactly. Using the stem of the shiitake mushroom. So mushrooms are grown to be sold in fresh in retail and the stem, it's like a cauliflower stem or a broccoli stem. People don't really know what to do with it. So it generally gets discarded. Um, so yeah, we use those stems in our products. That's great. Okay, Simon. Now, Simon, you've gone on an interesting journey because uh, who gives a crap started as kind of a social enterprise. It was <clears throat> more about solving a social problem rather than an environmental problem. But you've kind of found yourself as a bit of a representative of really sustainable products. How did you end up in that space? Yeah, so as you said, we got started because there was this huge sanitation problem at the time, 2.4 billion people without access to adequate sanitation, um, which is the number two killer of kids under the age of five every day. Um, and um, yeah, really kind of focus on that problem, but uh, also realized that if we we're creating a physical product that we're putting out into the world, we wanted to do it with the, you know, the lightest touch that we possibly could. And so when we looked at what materials we'd be using and how we package the product, we said, you know, it probably doesn't make sense to cut down trees to literally flush them down the toilet. So let's think about our raw materials a little bit differently. And then in terms of packaging, we moved away from plastic and, and wrapped our product in, in paper and created one of the first kind of, um, well, the first direct consumer model that was um, in the world, but also, you know, made with plastic free kind of, um, materials, which has now become, you know, quite a, um, not a popular model, but there's now a lot of people that have sort of followed in our footsteps since then, which is great kind of using that sustainability blade to, to tell their story. And so I think, um, you know, the, the takeaway there for us has been that we want to just continually get better at sustainability over time. So we sort of stumbled into it as something that we thought was the right thing to do. And then if, as we've kind of worked through a lot of the challenges over the last decade, we've become, um, you know, more and more expert in the space as, as time has gone on. What's What's been the biggest challenge for you? What's kind of been the hardest part of your sustainability journey? Um, I, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of hard parts to it. I mean, there's some really technical stuff like um, pallet wrap, for example, has been one of the most challenging parts of, you know, plastic to remove from our supply chain. The, I think we've successfully done it in some of our foreign markets, but in Australia, the OHS standards in warehouses make it very difficult to store a product like ours on, you know, racked shelving, which is how you typically store things in a warehouse without a pallet wrap, a plastic pallet wrap around the, the cartons. Um, and so we've, you know, very recently worked with, um, yeah, found someone that can help us to solve that problem. Um, so we're excited to be kind of rolling out, you know, what that solution looks like in the in the hopefully months ahead but probably years ahead knowing that these things take a bit longer than what you hope it's interesting how you're even worrying about the stuff that is not consumer facing it's yeah. a bit behind the, you know it's behind the scenes a lot of people wouldn't see it um david i want to come to you first now you're selling nfts as collectibles i hadn't realized there was such a huge market for this but can you just talk us through initially what was the initial concern what was the kind of environmental footprint of nfts 
that you were worried about? Yeah, um, obviously, I've been in the retail gaming space for 25 years. Um, what really relate to myself was that, you know, we are making a lot of plastic or trading cards or board games. So, you know, four and a half, five years ago, myself and my co-founder, we thought, well, you know, if we can bring collectability in what we sell in retail footprint uh, into digital, that, that would be a great idea. And obviously this NFT um, suddenly become a quite big buzzword in 2020, 21, and continues every day you see on the news. Mm. Um, and I think there's a bit of misconception uh, that all NFT are bad NFT or impact, um, you know, produce X amount of carbon footprints, et cetera. So, you know, it, it, you know we, we had no intention you know, from the beginning why we wanted to turn collectible business into a digital realm. We, we just thought, you know, the fans will really be engaged in, in a way that they can carry all their collectibles on their phones or a digital device. And obviously, um, last year and a half, media backlash coming up going, well, you know, that's killing this. This is how bad it is. All the environmentalists and the columnists write about NFTs all being quite negative. So the, some of the big challenges to educate and to be aware, you know, let, letting consumer to be aware that, you know, there are different methods and there are company who's out there like ours, uh, try to solve, solve these issues and, and be the leader in this space. And so the, the, the reason there's a large, well, the reason the articles are saying there's a large carbon footprint for NFTs mm. is because they're using cryptocurrency, which of course the mining of cryptocurrency uses a lot of energy. If it's not renewable energy, it's got a large carbon footprint. That's the kind yeah. of, it's interesting so, that you were trying to, you were kind of going, if we shift to NFTs, we can solve a lot of the plastic waste problem we have with a lot of our other collectibles. So you've kind of looked at the waste problem, kind of solved that and found yourself in, in the carbon footprint problem on the other side of it. So how have you then reduced the carbon footprint of your NFTs? So just to give you an idea, um, so roughly I worked it out, around 4 million box product or plastic toys will be equivalent to be around 1,200 containers to be shipping around the world to be in the retail shelves. And if we were minting it on purely on uh, Ethereum, um, what we call layer one, we're, we're looking at about 245 million kilowatts hour worth of um, you know, carbon footprints. Mm. But since we moved to a, what we really call a, a ZK route, zero knowledge, a layer two Ethereum, which basically allows um, all the NFT to be bundled, bundled together and to be minted or transferred at once. For that validation reason and that has really reduced us down to you know as little as about 430 um uh 430 kilograms of co2 and and just equivalent that's really traveling from los angeles to new york um uses about 662 uh per person with all um co2 um, that put things in perspective is not so bad for the whole 4 million um, yeah. NFT. And of course, without, you know, saying it will be eliminate everything. Um, so we have partnered up with um, blockchain companies who have the initiative to buy carbon credit to offset the balance of that carbon uh, footprint. Yeah. And ourselves, um, we announced last year, uh, we have a, a put a fund away uh, basically initiative really promoting uh, business out there or enterprise or charities that has a positive impact into the environment. And that's just another way for us to link forward and set the trend in this business. And, and the, the re really reason why we think the digital uptake is taking off is just the way people behave and people feel um, you know, they are used to everything going to digital, including how, how we're meeting today as well. Yeah, yeah. So with, it's interesting because all of you guys are really putting a lot of effort into uh, looking at sustainability in your supply chain, in, in, you know, fixing the products and making these great products that are environmentally friendly. 
do you get are you being pushed to that by customers or are you rewarded by customers for doing that for instance are, are customers willing to pay more because something is more sustainable or is that that not the case so michael i'll start with you um yeah so i think for the for the most part there's a segment of consumers that are willing to pay more for it but for the most part um all the research and and yeah, all, the, all the kind of evidence is that uh, most consumers, they, they want to do things that are environmentally friendly, but they're not necessarily willing to pay for it. Um, the good news is that um, being environmentally harmful is actually generally quite expensive to do. So if you take, take the case of um, producing meat from animals, um, you know, for example, a cow has got to eat 12 kilograms of plants to produce one kilogram of beef. It's a, it's a very inefficient way to produce food. And that's a big part of the the, the the uh, environmental impact of, of cattle is they've got to eat so much uh, so much grass and feed to produce a small amount of beef. Whereas when we're growing mushrooms, uh, we can produce a kilogram of our product out of a kilogram of, of mushrooms. So um, it ends up actually being much cheaper to produce um, products sustainably. You know, we've got a, our costs. Will, so at, at the moment, we're actually already at price parity with um, the, the slow cooked meats that we're replicating. So when we sell into Guzman and Gomez and Grilled and, and partners like that, um, actually, we end up even a little bit cheaper than, than uh, the, on their menu than the meats that they're replicating. Um, and as we scale, our costs are going are gonna to come down further. Um, so yeah, our goal is to actually make our products to have a better taste and texture than meat and be cheaper than meat. You know, it's taste and price are the two primary drivers of why people buy food. So mm -hmm. if we can beat animal meat on taste and price, then it's just a benefit that it's more environmentally friendly um, and, and ethical and healthier. Um, then we'll uh, we'll win and we'll be able to help end industrial animal agriculture. You're kind of lucky that it's cheaper in your case. I know that I, when I'm looking at a lot of recycling stuff, for instance, it's very frustrating because, <clears throat> you know, virgin plastic is cheaper than recycled plastic. And so there's no, you know, there's no incentive to go that kind of way. Well, Simon, what have you found in your journey? Like, have you found that, I mean, I'm not, when I get my Who Gives a Crap box, I'm, I can't even, I don't even know if you're charged anymore or not. <laughs> you know, I just think it's a good product. But are people price sensitive about this? Are they, you know, are they saying we want to pay more for sustainability or is it really still they go, no, no, it still has to be cheap and, you know, you've got to do all of the right things but still be as cheap as everything else? Yeah, I think I think there's there is definitely a you know a, a, a customer that is willing to pay more and and happy to do that. But um, broadly speaking, I think Michael's point is right that if you ask customers whether they'll pay more, they'll say yes. And then if you actually put a product in front of them side by side with one that's not sustainable and it's cheaper, they'll probably choose the not sustainable cheaper product because you know in that five seconds they're willing to make that ethical compromise um, for their wallet. And so what we've done is, you know, again, talking to the dynamics that Michael's talked about, our recycled tissue product is actually um, more cost effective to manufacture than a, you know, cutting down a tree and turning that into what's called virgin paper, because you don't have to cut down a tree and you're not turning this very hard timber into soft tissue, which is quite an energy intensive process. And so what's environmentally better is more cost effective with that product. But we also realized that, you know, recycled toilet paper in particular has a bit of a stigma around it that we thought would not be able to convert, you know, the 20% of the market that we'd like to see using our product. And so we said, if we truly want to be a mainstream brand, how do we also create a product that has some of the, um, you know, so strength and softness that you'd see in some of the really top of the range products that are out there. And so we used a bamboo to, to create that product. And so we've ended up with a product that, um, you know, on the recycled side of our, our range is, is, the same price or less than what you'd pay in supermarkets and on the bamboo range is more of a premiumized product and that way we allow customers to kind of self-select where they want to sit um, in terms of you know how they think about um, that trade-off between price and and um, yeah quality yeah david look i don't even know if nfts are more or less expensive if they're environmentally friendly i mean what, what are you paying 67 million dollars for an nft nowadays uh where does, does price even come into it like it do people care about that in the NFT world? Like why, you know, are other people being pressured to do the right things? Yeah, I guess um, when you look at comparison with the physical world um, and, you know, the same equivalent toys, what you'd be selling. Um, initially, when we rolled out the NFT, well, these digital collectible, when we launched it to the market, we were thinking possibly the younger kids will get it. And that's the, the target because they're so used to playing games and be online all the time. Um, so they probably got it. 
but we have found that majority of our customers are obviously, um, apart from being, um, have, have to have an income, they love the nostalgia, some of the property that we're bringing in. So what we have found, a lot of the users and our consumers are even age up to in the uh, mid 40s, 48 range, 32 to 48. And that's where a massive core spender is coming from that audience. So obviously, um, in comparison that, would they be buying that plastic toy in the shop? Uh, they, they probably would never go and buy a $100 statue in a gaming shop, but they were willing to prepare to spend uh, $100 on a 3D digital collectible. Um, and I guess what we really demonstrate is why would you want to buy it in the first place? Um, it's the, really the utility value of it. You know, you could be part of it, that augmented reality, we have that showroom um, and that whole mixed reality experience for the user. So I think that really resonate with a lot of these um, customers. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm pretty sure a lot of them go, well, I would never buy it if it was, I'm, I'm never gonna buy 300 collectibles if, because I just got no room at home to place it. And simply because it's digital, they're probably willing to buy a bit more because it's all stored on their phone or devices. Yeah, wow. Now, just, you guys have all kind of gone through this journey of this sustainability journey and trying to make your companies better, I guess. There's people watching today who are probably, you know, want to start up companies and have ideas about that. Do you, do you think you kind of have to solve all the sustainability products before you get started? Or is that something you can only do on the way and try to get better as you go? And I guess, as part of that as well, how are you kind of communicating with your customers about what you're doing and what you're doing well and what you want to do better? Uh, Simon, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think I think we definitely take the the approach of um, get it to eighty percent and then figure out how to you know what's the roadmap for the remaining twenty percent that you want to achieve over the, you know whatever the right time frame is, and for us um, that eighty percent benchmark is constantly changing as we're learning more, you know, new technologies becoming available. And so what's possible is shifting over time. And so what 80% looks like is, you know, different from one year to the next. Um, so that's certainly the approach that, that we've taken and I think works relatively well. I don't think it works for every product that's out there. And um, what we've also said is that, you know, we'll always be open and honest with our customers and take them along for the journey with us. So we try to be very transparent about where we're falling short in terms of what our own expectations are. And then also the work that we're doing to try and close that gap. And so by being transparent about where we are falling short, it helps to build a level of trust with our customer that I think is pretty powerful. And um, that's something that, you know, we can, we can, um, yeah. So you'll, you'll kind of, you'll fess up the things you're struggling with or where you can't find solutions and that kind of thing as well. Do you get, um, do you find there's kind of a misunderstanding sometimes with consumers about what, what you're doing or what the best approach is? Yeah, I think I think what um, we we think about what's popular in terms of environmentalism, what's you know actually kind of the best solution in terms of you know what sustainability looks like, and then what's commercially viable. And if you kind of think about those three circles and the Venn diagram that they create, the sweet spot to be playing in is kind of the um, you know right in the middle of all three of those. And then in time, we try to. Um, talk to our customer and educate them to try and close those circles in together to create more overlap. Um, and as technology shifts, what's possible as a business will you know, shift down as well. And so we're always trying to think about what that Venn diagram looks like and how we can bring those circles in closer together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Michael? We, you know, what would you say to people who are kind of starting out on this journey and, and, and want to have a sustainable company? You know, where do they start? Do you start with one problem or do you, you know, can you get, overwhelmed by all the issues you're facing yeah yeah i think you definitely can get overwhelmed by the issues and you shouldn't let the um the good yeah good yeah, shouldn't let trying to do a good thing um uh, be, be put off by trying to get everything right at the start so for us um you know our, our mission of if we can replace uh, meat with um uh, with mushroom products that's where we're going to have the the biggest impact for our business so that was just that core kind of fundamental mission behind the business is where we focused and initially you know, when you're a startup, you've got to focus on finding product market fit, figuring out your supply chain and you're finding customers, you know, all, all of those core pieces. And you, you really can't, you, 
don't have the resources to do too many things at once. But if, you, if you're finding a business model that has a really good, strong mission, that, that's a great place to start and then add the other things along on the way. So yeah, we've gone carbon neutral more recently and done recyclable packaging and done all of that as we've uh, as we've started to scale. You, but that's interesting. When you when you start out as a kind of sustainable business, like you're saying, we're gonna you know replace meat, for instance, do you find then there's a pressure on you to be sustainable in every element? Like people are like, well, how come you're using plastic or something? Do you find that because you're in that area, you kind of expectations placed on you are far higher than others? Yeah, there's a little bit of that, um, but there's also it's that that's that is part of our value proposition. So so when we're talking to a Guzman and Gomez or a Grilled, um, you know they're wanting to be, they're wanting to become more sustainable businesses because you know their consumers are demanding it and and they want to do good for the world. So we can go to them and offer a, a, a more complete solution. You know we can help them replace meat, but then we can offer them packaging that's recyclable and partnerships with companies that can then recycle that packaging. Um, we can give them a product that is completely carbon neutral. So when they're calculating their own carbon emissions, we're helping to helping them to reduce that. Um, so yeah, it, it, we get a bit more pressure for it, but it's also a key differentiator for us in the market. So we're kind of ha happy to do that because it's good for the world and happy to do that because it, it's actually good for us commercially too. Yeah, great. Uh, <clears throat> what about you, David? I mean, you're in a, a different space there. Are, are you kind of the only group doing this kind of carbon neutral NFT thing or is that becoming the norm is it you know being pushed it pushed into that yeah so when we started the business we always knew you know how can we take away the plastic in the shipping you know the whole supply chain a bit better and obviously a big part about the blockchain is is a ever evolving uh updates you know there's technology in this field is constantly changing and fast moving. Now, um, we're not the only company. You see more and more companies now moving towards these uh, layer two or zero knowledge uh, solution. Uh, but what we have seen is the amount of encouragement and trends from our licensed source. you got big corporates uh, like Disney, Marvel, Universal, all these Warner Brothers studio who traditionally just do consumable licensing now are willing to test and understand. And most of these companies have set themselves, you know, some sort of environmental um, and ethical uh, product or program within their organization. So, you know, we're, we're very lucky. A lot of them have used us as a trial um, to, to really believe that this is the train. So it's not really just you know, the technology behind it, it's been very well supported by uh, these major brands to uh, be, you know, taking the lead in the initiative. It's quite interesting that the kind of pressure on big companies to be seen as doing the right thing sustainability wise is kind of filtering down in otherwise. There's a question here from Nick, uh, who says, behavioral change is key to success in these early formative days. What have they learned? What have you guys learned? With their DTC ventures to date, with conscious consumers and business take up, businesses take up. Does anyone want to answer or explain that question to me? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, I can jump in. So, so yeah, I guess our our early our early adopter customers and you know, kind of our beachhead niche was this was the sort of vegan vegetarian customers who, um, yeah, who were already looking for products like ours. Um, and so, yeah, in those kind of early days, those formative years of, of selling, um, you know, that it's good to build scale with a core group of really passionate, fanatical customers there. Um, but our mission is to help end industrial animal agriculture. So vegans and vegetarians are already not eating meat. You know, we don't want to replace lentils with mushrooms. We want to replace uh, meat with mushrooms. Um, but getting some of that support from those early customers who can then become advocates, they introduce us to their meat eating friends when they're cooking at home or when they're going out to restaurants. Um, that, that's good. And there's, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of startup theory on that, you know, nail your kind of beachhead niche customers and then leverage that, those customers to help you expand out into the mass market. So yeah. And you, did you start predominantly in restaurants first? Was that your first, what was the kind, what was your first method and why did you choose that approach? Yeah. So yeah, we went restaurants first. Um, for us, um, we, we've, we wanted to really build our culinary credentials. And so we wanted to work with chefs um, and have people in the food industry um, kind of fall in love with our product. We also, as we're doing our product development, wanted to make sure, you know, is that they're the most discerning uh, people in food. So if we can get them excited to use our product. 
um, then, then we got success on the product development side. So yeah, we kind of, our first customer was Heston Blumenthal, the, the British um, three Michelin star chef. Um, and then we kind of focused on that sort of Michelin star level and high level restaurants. And then we've kind of come down into the premium quick service restaurant space. So, so you've got high quality um, pre premium fast food like uh, Guzman and Gomez and grilled and ribs and burgers and fishbowl um, venues like those. Um, so yeah, kind of really wanting to do well in that sort of foodie culinary space, mm. uh, build a really strong premium brand, and then we'll we'll continue working our way down the market. And you know, we do a little bit of retail in kind of independent retail and premium retail, like like Harris Farm and some some good IGAs and independent retailers, and then we'll we'll expand out more mass market retail as we grow too. A question here for Simon, actually. So, I mean, people asked, uh, have you investigated large scale hemp or seaweed products? <laughs> um, <clears throat> we haven't investigated seaweed. That's actually an interesting idea. Uh, we have looked at alternative substrates. So um, hemp, straw, um, oat is something that we've been talking about recently. So there is probably a lot of opportunity there in the future. One of the challenges that we have is that, um, you know, the manufacturing process is quite a um, asset heavy process. So typically to start your own manufacturing facility, you need about 100 million Aussie, I think would be kind of the entry level kind of um, production facility. And so we have to find the right partners to engage in that R&D with until we're in a position to um, take on those assets ourselves, which is something that we're, you know, we don't want to do right now. Maybe at some point in the future, that makes sense. And so finding the right partners to help engage in that R&D is kind of a big part of, you know, innovation around substrate for us in the future. It's interesting that because you, you talk about that, this is, you know, the large amount of capital needed sometimes to do the right thing. You know, it's not necessarily, and often that's why people end up doing the wrong approach because it's the cheapest approach, it's the simplest approach. <clears throat> We've talked about from the kind of consumer perspective, like your consumers helping out or be willing to pay more. Is there support, like, you know, is there support? There's so much talk from governments about reducing emissions and doing the, you know, reducing waste in Australia is a big focus and that kind of thing. Do they actually back it up? You know, do they support the companies that are doing the right thing and say, oh, you know, we'll, we'll help with the capital or we'll help you do this? Do you actually find there's any kind of assistance from governments, state or federal, to actually do the right thing environmentally? I think there, there definitely is for, um, for certain businesses. I know people that have run businesses that have done really well with kind of government support, particularly on the sustainability side of things. It's not an area that we've, you know, committed a bunch of time to ourselves because there is this huge rent seeking phenomenon that occurs when you're chasing grants or, um, you know, different types of, of government funding. Um, and so we've always said, you know, let's use the toolkit that's available to, to businesses to try and solve those problems rather than um, kind of getting into that, that you know, territory. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily the, the best way to go about it. And we've seen other people be very successful at, yeah, at pulling it off, working with the right government partners as well. Mm. Yeah, for, us, uh, for us, if anything, um, government make thing, makes things a little bit more difficult. There was a recent Senate inquiry led by the nationals around name like wanting to ban plant-based meat companies from using words like meat burgers and sausages so i'm not sure because they're, they're worried that's going to negatively impact the meat industry so i, I don't know if we've got to then call our products like plant-based discs instead of burgers or you know <laughs> and it's it's pretty frustrating because it's like the government's you know firstly like what's in a hot dog like naming conventions in food and in the meat industry are already <laughs> you know not necessarily right like peanut butter is no there is dog butter. in it there's definitely dog in it so it's true <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so just that that kind of pushback is we find a little bit challenging you know that, that it would be much better Th this changes but the reality is we the change is going to happen anyway like food product uh, in, in our space anyway the change is going to happen um, our products are going to taste better than meat, be cheaper than meat, and are going to disrupt the meat industry. But the government should be wanting, like protecting farmers is a great point, but we still work with farmers. We work with mushroom farmers instead of cattle or chicken farmers. Um, so let's help farmers transition away from producing meat from animals to growing mushrooms or, you know, soybeans or other products that can make meat. And that's where the government should step in and help. And that's a really interesting point. I mean, as somebody who's also been hauled before various Senate committees for merely to being honest about the carbon footprint of beef in Australia. I mean, you, these we, you are, if you are setting out to change the environment, you still have startup companies that are changing what's happening, you come up against the existing powers are the really strong ones. They're the ones who have 
big profit margins. They're the ones that have lobbyists and contact with government. And that's, so does, does it actually make it harder for you when you're actually starting out? Yeah, well, I mean, those, yeah, those those things, yeah, those things can. But I mean, it, the, yeah, the reality is there are there are fairly small um, small hurdles along the way. You know, there's, there's uh, I think it's unlikely that we're going to get banned from using the word burger and sausage because, you know, the reality is the the, the argument from the meat industry is that we're um, confusing customers by having these people, consumers are confused when and they're buying plant based burgers accidentally. But our whole point of difference is that the product is plant-based. Like it's in yeah. big writing. Like that's why, that's that's how we're selling our product. So if, if just no one is getting confused, no one's going yeah. by the, yeah. talking about this, the um, the marketing side of this that comes to mind is Oatly versus, you know, the government, I think in Sweden, where the government said that they couldn't use the word milk in any of their advertising. And so they um, basically got sued by, you know, the kind of dairy lobbyists or whatever. And then they they published the entire lawsuit and turned it into a huge marketing campaign for them, which ultimately was the kind of breakthrough moment that shot them into fame in that country. So I think yeah. there's kind of you know two sides to those um, conversations. When you are getting faced with these ridiculous kind of pressures, you can always think about how to turn that around and make it into a hero moment. <laughs> I think that's, that's a really good point. And I guess this, yeah. this is the interesting thing for you guys who are starting with sustainability businesses that are direct to consumer often. How do you get publicity how do you get your name out there i mean do you need a bit of controversy sometimes to help that uh, happen i mean you know we saw simon sat on a toilet for was it yeah. or something I, I don't know if that yeah. works for all of us here you know, you know our whole name is controversial so it's kind of <laughs> it's definitely been our tactic but <laughs> maybe less so we with the do, others <laughs> we should do a mushroom based toilet paper collaboration yeah. <laughs> it's actually quite a good idea well I'll, I'll write that one down for later there's a question here from sarah uh if everyone is ordering wgac online you, you guys are gonna have to explain to me what that is how do you reduce the carbon emissions from all the delivery trucks uh rather than just going to the supermarket interesting yeah so this is i think wgac is who gives a crap so this is i think a oh yes a of course really yeah. interesting example of where um you know what the popular environmental opinion the what's actually best for the environment and the kind of commercially what makes sense if we kind of come back to that framework you know i think the there's the popular opinion here that having deliveries is bad for the environment but if you look at that question it says if everyone is ordering who gives a crap online and if everyone literally every single household ordered who gives a crap online that would actually be better for the environment than people going to the supermarket because You'd be able to have full delivery trucks dropping off at every single house and the carbon efficiency for that would be astronomically low compared to a single person driving in my case 10 kilometers to the supermarket to buy toilet paper when they run out and possibly not buying anything else and so the the popular kind of piece there says um you know mm -hmm. we've got to make all these assumptions about what's in the truck and therefore it's not efficient but um you know the the what's actually best for the environment is that we get every single person to buy online and then we can reduce carbon emissions in that manner and yeah. then what's commercially kind of possible for us is well if we're trying to reduce those emissions then we can and we can't get everyone to buy online then we can offset the emissions which is what we do today or move to electric vehicles which is where we're trying to go in the future where yeah. those deliveries will be completely emission free as opposed to to offset but kind of coming back to that framework, it's one of those interesting problems of, you know, what seems like it's the best solution on the surface, if you scratch a little bit deeper, is actually not, not always the yeah. solution. And so and it's, it's that comparing like for like, you've got to then do the carbon footprint of people traveling to the supermarket as well. Yeah, is, totally. And I, then, I do like the fact that very convenient that the, the best environmental solution here is that every single human being orders who gives a crap and it's delivered to your door. How convenient, Simon. <laughs> and then I, I love that you also have to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and say, well, if I wasn't buying who gives a crap and I was buying something else at the supermarket, what raw materials are being used? Is that a virgin tree? If it's not a virgin tree, is the you know recycled material being imported from China or Canada or Chile, which are the three places where we import recycled paper from into Australia? And so there's a lot of kind of peeling back the curtain that has to go on to get to the bottom of you know what's actually the best environmental solution here. One of the things that one of the things that I find fascinating with this is that when you do go to a supermarket is that, so for instance, toilet paper is a classic example. The majority of the shelves are filled with um, 
with virgin toilet paper. I mean, I, why do we just allow that to be the case? Why not? You know, if it isn't better for the environment to have recycled toilet paper, could could you know, is there a supply such that you could it could all be made of recycled? You know, could you? Why do we not? actually say let's you know why do we leave it up to consumers to go i'm going to rely on the 10 percent of consumers that care them enough to buy the best thing why do we not push towards the actual environmentally you know and say that's what you should actually do i mean does that happen anywhere you guys are dealing with global markets is that the case anywhere or is it all like this yeah we haven't we haven't seen that anywhere else in the world i mean that's a great place where government could step in and have massive impact if they you know like banning plastic straws said what if we ban the use of you know virgin timber in these particular products where it's just absolutely not required um, we haven't seen anywhere globally i think you know germany's got probably the highest recycled paper penetration of any market um, that we've looked at globally just because it's a much more environmentally conscious um, consumer and um, more advanced in terms of you know how they think about manufacturing as well David, a question for you, because you're dealing with online, you do this online market. Do you notice differences between different countries in terms of people's environmental awareness and what they want? You know, do you notice that this market as well, you know, Sweden or whatever, they're like really alert to this. And I guess flowing on from that, we'll go to the others to kind of go, where does Australia sit in this? Are we good, bad, average? Where do we go? So mm -hmm. starting with you, David. Yeah, so um, we do monitor um, where our users and you know customers are coming from. Um, they obviously we trade in about two hundred eighty two regions and countries. Um, US will have to be our top on the list, sitting around the thirty five, um, up some sometime up to forty percent. Um, North America we got including Canada is pretty good, um, and Europe is very large. UK, France. Uh, Germany is always competing on the top five, but definitely we're seeing huge uh, growth in Australia. Um, Australia constantly is our top five uh, customer uh, usage. And yeah, I, I, I really do believe that it's becoming more fashionable. Uh, people are becoming more environmentally aware um, just simply because our generation, we live through recycling and prior to that, there wasn't any. And the next generation will just pick it up. Um, in New Zealand here, we had banned plastic bag completely from retail shops. Um, so that's government initiative. So they can do things like you mentioned, you know, there's certain material, raw material can be used. Um, and, and it has been done before, you know, there are certain timbers now, we, we call them endangered species timbers that you can't use them for making furniture or panels for floors. Um, so it's really, um, and I think a major part is really the corporate governance. If the, if the companies are setting out to wanting to do that, um, and as, as we all know, it's all about the bottom lines for consumers in their pocket, how much can we afford to spend? I mean, you look at the petrol price, as being a huge topic the last fortnight, you know, um, does it mean people are driving less to the supermarket now because simply it, it costs them a lot more and uh, and hopefully that behaviour will lead to they are prepared to shop online, less traffic in the, uh, on, on the road um, and, and speed up the whole supply chain and different factors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think is it's an ecosystem everything intertwined one way to another for sure yeah i mean the cost of petrol means i'm no longer getting my nfts from the supermarket i'm just you know, not doing it anymore um michael <laughs> with you i mean you, we talk about is, is australia a kind of good place when it comes to caring about sustainability i mean you're in a, in a fascinating area where i know that we are one of the biggest meat consumers in the world so do you feel do you you know you're dealing with international markets you're in britain singapore america that kind of stuff do you think Australia is behind? Well, where are we? Yeah, yeah. So we eat 110 kilograms of land animals per person per year in Australia, and that's the, as as you know, Craig. Yeah, that's the that's the high, highest up there with the highest in the world. Um, we are doing a pretty good job in uh, the meat alternative space, though. 11% um, of Australians are now vegan or vegetarian, and another, uh, depending on the survey, between 30 and 40% of Australians 
when surveyed are actively trying to reduce or actively want to reduce their meat consumption. Um, and those figures are those figures are actually pretty good globally. Um, so yeah, there's been a good take up of uh, meat alternatives. That that said, our meat consumption continues to grow. The the rate of change of moving towards meat alternatives, you know, it's still a sub one percent of the of the overall um, meat market in Australia. Um, so so there's a lot of lot of room for growth and, and improvement there. But but yeah, good good good. We're big meat eaters, but good signs that we're we're starting to make good transitions. Change is happening, I guess. Exactly. Okay. We've only got two, we've got a minute left, so I'm just going to very quickly one one tip from each of you for people who are thinking of doing startups in this kind of environmental space. What's your one tip, Simon? You first. Um, don't get you know, paralysis from trying to overthink everything. Just get started and continuously improve over time. Okay, nice, Michael. What's your tip for people starting the space? Yeah, just just do it. Um, like. Yeah, I did a business before that wasn't sustainability focused in Shoes of Prey, um, doing Fable Now that is, uh, you know, this is what I'd want to be doing if money didn't matter. It's just combining kind of passions and what's good for the world and and what what you're good at is just a, it's a really wonderful, really rewarding thing. Makes it makes it easy to get out of bed when you've got a, a good mission behind your company. So exactly. Say. And, and, and what about you, David? What's your one tip for people starting out? Yeah, I, I think for all the listeners out there, be persistent. You know, if you have a goal, ambition, just be persistent and pursue that. Um, believe in it. Um, most important is, you know, if you're not chasing the money, um, the likely you're going to be successful is going to be much greater. Great. Thank you, uh, Michael, Simon and David. Fantastic panel. Good luck with all your ventures. I look forward to uh, eating some vegetarian meat, going to the toilet afterwards and looking at my NFTs in the phone. <laughs> All sustainable. <laughs> awesome. Thank Thanks, Craig. Thanks,